Well, we're going to talk about um, 1844 and where Jesus went in 1844. But first, we need to do some background history, which I think will help us understand. And before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to delve into your word, which is so important to Seventh-day Adventists, what happened in 1844. And we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit now to lead and guide us, allow us to have ears to hear and the ability to speak clearly. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I look at the Adventist church and its people today, I, I see that there are so many Adventists who ha are, are like having an identity crisis. They, they, they don't know, they don't seem to know why they are Seventh-day Adventists. And they are confused and they don't really stand up for what they believe because they don't really believe, understand what they do believe. And this thing about 1844, which is all wrapped up with the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, it is so vital to our Adventist identity. It gives us our identity. If that is ever destroyed, then Adventism itself is destroyed. You may as well stop being a Seventh-day Adventist if you don't believe what happened in 1844. It's what identifies us as a as a group of Christians who are following what our Lord Jesus is doing. We're practically the only um, denomination or, or Christian group, whatever you want to call us, we are the only ones who really understand what Jesus is doing. And we're supposed to um, spread that message to all the other Christians who are confused. Where are most Christians? They're in Babylon. Babylon means confusion. So let's do some let's do some background. In the 1950s, I mean, some of you will know this, but we'll do it anyway. In the 1950s, a man by the name of Walter Martin, who was supposedly an expert on cults, he had already written a, a book about Jehovah's Witnesses and one about Mormons, and he called them cults. In other words, they were not they were not part of the body of Christ. And he was going to do his third book on Seventh-day Adventists. And he was going to call us a cult too. But he went to the general conference and he told them what he was going to do. And he said, I'm here to, to tell you that I will label you a cult unless you can prove that you're not. And so what result, this resulted in about 18 months of uh, meetings with leaders of the Adventist Church and Walter Martin. And at the end of it, uh, he published his, his book and he, he declined to call us a cult. And we published a book called Questions on Doctrine, which was answers to the questions that Walter Martin was asking. Nobody of the church leaders, not one of them put their name to, to the authorship of that book. Nobody wanted to do that <laughs> for obvious reasons, because they changed our theological beliefs. And it was in two crucial areas. They changed our beliefs on the atonement, which they said was completed now at the cross. And by the way, these are the things that um, Walter Martin objected to. It's generally believed in, in Christendom in general that the atonement finished on the cross. We have never believed that until now, until we changed it. And the other thing they changed was the human nature of Christ. We have always believed in the past up till then that the human nature of Christ was the same as fallen human nature. Now, you will find today that most Adventists, especially in the leadership, they believe that Jesus Christ came with the, with the unfallen human nature. But you just have to ask yourself the question, who did Jesus come to save? Did he come to save unfallen human beings or did he come to save fallen human beings? I think the answer is obvious. But let's carry on. We now want to go to um, the 1960s 
And there was a man by the name of, um, of Robert Brinsmead. Some of you may have heard of him. Now, all of this is happening now in the South Pacific Division. Robert Brinsmead was a, an Australian, and he started a movement called the Sanctuary Movement or the Awakening. Now, if if we were to um, give him a label today, we would call him uh, an, uh, an advocate of the of last days theology, because that's what it's called today. He was basically preaching last day theology, which meant that um, which meant that the last generation of people on earth would have reached maturity or we can use that dreadful word perfection, which is what most people, when you analyze the 144,000, you can't really get around the fact that they have reached maturity, they have reached perfection. And he was preaching this, and he was preaching historic Adventism, and he was preaching the sanctuary message, and he caused a huge stir in the South Pacific Division. And one of the one of the facts of life of being in a in any institution, and I'm I'm not just saying at Seventh Day Adventism, if if a movement arises within an institution, like it can be a church or it can be a political party, or and if it's not controlled by the leaders, they will automatically oppose it because they will see a movement with that occurs without their control as a threat to their authority. And this always happens. So this, this man, Gavin is following in the South Pacific Division, and many people were thrilled at the message they were hearing, and he started a movement. And of course, because it wasn't under the control of the church leaders, they opposed it. So the problem was, Robert Brinsmead was such a powerful advocate and speaker of what he believed in, none of the church leaders or the pastors could could stand up to him. They they <laughs> they, they couldn't debate him. They would they would always lose. So the church leadership in that part of the world was casting around for somebody who could um, who could stand up to Robert, uh, Robert Brinsmead and and basically destroy his movement. And they found the, this man by the name of Desmond Ford. I'm sure you must have heard of him. Now, Desmond Ford found the weapon he needed to destroy uh, Robert Brinsmead in the book Questions on Doctrine. And it was sitting there all the time. The, maybe the church leaders and the pastors hadn't read the book. <laughs> but, but in this book, you have the fact that Jesus is not the same as us in our fallen nature. So he had a nature that was different. Therefore, Jesus had an advantage over us when it came to the battle against sin. In other words, we cannot do what Jesus did. When Jesus said, follow me, we cannot do that because he was different in his humanity to us. Do you get it? <laughs> so therefore, therefore, we can never reach perfection. We can never reach maturity. And therefore, Robert Brinsmead and his whole theology is blown out of the water by this by, that, by this particular argument. And that is why, that is one of the reasons why this, this um, theology, which, which was called the new theology back then, is so prevalent in the church today. So anyway, Desmond, Robert Brinsmead is, is on the back foot. Desmond Ford is on the rise. And they appoint him to be the theology teacher at Avondale College. And so he's teaching all the uh, ministers. All the, all the future ministers. And after a couple of years, these ministers, these young ministers graduate and they come out into the church and they start preaching. And the old pastors, they start hearing things that they disturb them very much because they're basically preaching a new theology taught by Desmond Ford. And so they raise, a, raise the alarm. And they raise the alarm to the point where they decide that they're going to have a special meeting of the South Pacific Division, and they're going to examine Desmond Ford's teachings and see if it's 
Institute and regular Seventh Day Adventist teaching. And the, the, the objectors, the, the retired pastors and some others, who are now called concerned brethren, CBs, which has now become a, a term, a derogatory term, uh, which is, is cast at people who do not who oppose this new theology. Um, the CBs are allowed to participate. So you basically have Desmond Ford defending himself and the CBs accusing him in front of the uh, a panel, panel of leaders of the church in the South Pacific Division. At the end of it, the South Pacific Division decide that, that this is good. Desmond Ford's teaching is good, regular Seventh-day Adventist teaching. So Desmond Ford now goes off to, um, off to America, and he's, a te he's the, the theology teacher at Pacific Union College. And he does the same thing. He teaches the young men, and they come out and preach this new theology to all the, uh, all the people in, in America, or some of them anyway. And um, same thing happens. People, old, the older pastors prick up their ears and they say, this is wrong. And, the, and, and exactly the same thing happens again. This time at a place called Glacier View, they call in about 121, I think it was, church leaders. Desmond Ford comes and, and presents. They actually gave him seven months paid leave to prepare himself for, to present his, um, his beliefs. So off he goes and... Um, and uh, they have this meeting, and at the end of it, the, the North. This is the North American division now. The North American division decides this is not good Seventh Day Adventist teaching, and they take away his credentials, and he's basically finished as a pastor in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And so now you have you have one division saying this is good Seventh Day Adventist teaching, and you have another one saying. This is not good Seventh Day Adventist teaching, and this 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 um this split has never ever been resolved. It's never been addressed. It's never ever talked about. When um when they had the meeting at Glacier View, but that was in by the way it was in 1981. When they had that meeting, they took a a, a survey of of the 121 leaders who were there, and basically they asked the question. Do you believe do you believe Desmond Ford is correct in his theology, or do you believe he's wrong? And and twenty one percent of the leaders believed he was right. So you 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 have a, a growing uh, minority, which is now the majority in the church, believing in Desmond Ford's new theology. Incidentally, when he was at Pacific Union College, he came out. He sort of You've heard of this expression coming out of the closet. <laughs> Basically, Desmond Ford came out of the closet in 1979 when he preached a sermon at, at, at Pacific Union College where he said, I have never, ever believed in the sanctuary message. So he was quite frank about that. And the sanctuary message is the key to what happened in 1844. It's the key to the investigative judgment. It's the key to Adventist identity. So that's the situation we have at the moment in the church, and it's never been resolved. The, the, way, the, the way the leadership, you know, I feel sorry for, I would hate to be an Adventist leader. I really would, because they're under so much pressure from all sorts of areas. But what the, the way they deal with it is they ignore it. They simply ignore it and hope that it goes away. And to be honest, it has gone away. Um, I remember when I first became an Adventist, that was back in the um, uh, late 1970s and 1980s. This was a huge issue in the church. Everybody was talking about it. It was, it was like climate change today in the world. Everybody was talking COVID-19. Everybody was talking about it. It was a huge issue. But now it's not. And so the, the, the way the church deals with it is, is, is kind of effective. People don't people don't realize that what we were is not what we are anymore, and um, it's something that uh, we, as Adventists, individually, we all have to face this. We all have to um, make our decisions. So, what I would like to suggest now 
is I would like to just look at one particular part of of um, Desmond Ford's new theology, and that is where Jesus went in 1844. And can we prove it? Well, firstly, I would like, you need to take your Bibles, by the way. You need to either have a physical Bible or look it up on your phone. And we can find a very good indication of where Jesus went in in uh, 34 AD, because this is a very this is also very important because Desmond Ford and his followers believe that when Jesus resurrected, he went straight into the most holy place in heaven, because the reason they believe that is because it says that he went to heaven and he sat down on the right-hand side of the Father on his throne. And so they think, they think that there's only one throne in heaven and it's in the most holy place. Therefore, Jesus must have gone into the most holy place. And it sounds logical but maybe there's more than one throne in heaven. So let's, if you look in uh, the first chapter of Revelation, the, you will find Jesus is in verse, um, yeah, verse 12. Yeah. And I turned and see, saw the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with. Okay, so here is Jesus, and he's walking amongst the seven candlesticks. Now, everything that in the in the um, in the Book of Revelation is taken from the the Old Testament. So, where do we find se uh, seven candles or seven or uh, seven headed candlestick? We find it in the holy place. So Jesus is in the holy place. Why why is he not? Why is he not in the courtyard? Because the courtyard is the beginning of the count of the um, of the sanctuary. He's not in the courtyard because the courtyard represents his crucifixion. He's now he's now taken the next step in the plan of salvation, which is going from the courtyard into the into the holy place. And if you look closely, more closely, in more detail of the um, book of Revelation you find that you're going for a walk through the sanctuary. Jesus goes from the holy, from the, from the candlesticks. He goes to the table of showbread, which is the throne that he sat down on with his father in the holy place. Okay. There are two stacks of bread on the table of showbread. That's where he sat down with his father. That is a throne. And then there is a, um, uh, the uh, altar of incense. <clears throat> and Jesus moves. You, you, if you look at the beginning of the introduction to the temp, to the uh, to the uh, trumpets, Jesus is standing beside the altar of incense. And we don't get to the to the um, most holy place until we get to the end of chapter eleven. So we're going. The Book of Revelation is taking us for a walk through the sanctuary. That's the first point I want to make. Now. The next thing we need to do is go to Hebrews, and I want to show you the only evidence that Desmond Ford has for his new theology. It's in chapter 6, and it says... Which hope we had... Oh, sorry, chapter 6, verse 19 which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth in, into that within the veil. And there is it. See, he went into the most holy place. But you'll notice that doesn't say that he went within the second veil. That word Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteron means second. It's not there. 
but we do find it somewhere else. If you turn to chapter nine, when when Paul wants to, I believe Paul wrote this, when, when Paul wants to make it clear that he's talking about the most holy place, he uses the word second veil. And it's in chapter nine, verse three. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Is that understandable so far? Okay. When Paul, I'll just, <laughs> when Paul wants to indicate the most holy place, he says the second veil, within the second veil. There are actually three veils in the sanctuary. There is a, a curtain into the courtyard. There's a curtain into the holy place, and there is a curtain into the most holy place. All of those curtains, incidentally, represent the flesh of Christ. When you're trying to find God, when you're trying to find God, the sinner has to go through the veil. In other words, he has to part the curtain. And when he's parting the curtain, when he's tearing open the curtain, he's symbolically tearing the flesh of Christ. That's what, it's, that's what it means. You can find the, the veil is defined as the flesh of Christ in chapter 10. Let me give chapter 10. Yeah, verse 20. So, but getting back to, um, we need to go back to chapter 9. Because here we have something very interesting. First of all, the word for, for uh, holy place is hagia in the Greek. And I'm sure you've heard of this. The word for most holy place is hagia hagion, two words. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could find a verse in Hebrews, because Hebrews is the key place for understanding this whole concept of where Jesus went. Wouldn't it be great if we could find or verses that define what Hagia is? Now, we find the word Hagia about seven times in, in the book of he the book, the Hebrews. And every time, if you look at any Bible, if you look at, just make a comparison with Bibles. When I'm going to tell you where you find this word in a minute. And every Bible uh, interprets this word differently. Sometimes they say it's the holy place. Sometimes they say it's the sanctuary. Sometimes they say it's the most holy place. Sometimes they say it's the holiest of all. It's total confusion. And all Bibles are totally confused about how to interpret this word. So wouldn't it be nice if the author himself defines the word for us? Wouldn't that be good? All right, here it is. Chapter 9, and we're going to read the verse 3 verses. And I want you to notice how Paul defines the word Hagia. I'm going to tell you when the word Hagia pops up. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now that word there is hagion for sanctuary. It's not hagia. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the, the um, for there was a tabernacle made, the first. So he's talking, what's, what's he talking about? He's talking about the holy place now made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the Hagia. Do you get it? Uh, I need to ram this home for you. That part of the sanctuary, which contains the, the um, candlesticks and the table and the showbread, that is called the Hagia. In other words, the Hagia is the holy place. You understand? Yeah, you really got you really got to understand this. <laughs> it's the whole key to understanding this. All right. And after the second veil, so now he's talking about the most holy place, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. That's the Hagia Hagion. 
the holiest of all in Greek is Hagia Hagion. So here Paul defines for us what is the holy place and what is the most holy place. The holy place is Hagia. The most holy place is Hagia Hagion. So we're Whenever we see Hagia, especially in the book of Hebrews, because he's defining it for us in the book of Hebrews, whenever we see the word Hagia, we must understand it to be the holy place. All right? Now, the key verse, the key verse for us is Hebrews. Um, 12, uh, sorry, uh, chapter 9, verse 12. And fortunately, the King James gets this. They translate the uh, Hagia here correctly. And you should, you should look in your, um, your Norwegian Bibles, or maybe you're, you're using some other, maybe, I don't know. Sure. Do we have some Americans here tonight? <laughs> look in there. If, if, they, if they have uh, modern translations, you, you need to look at this. Um, anyway, verse 12 says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the Hagia. And the King James gets it right. They translate holy place. He went into the holy place, having obtained eternal direct, uh, redemption for us. But that's that's one of the reasons why. In the English-speaking Adventist world, there are many people who do not like the King James <laughs> because, according to them, it translates the wrong way. By the way, the, the, new, the new international version, it translates the word Hagia. Um, there, it's, it's about, I think it's, I think it's seven times in the book of Hebrews, five times the new international version translates it most holy place, which is totally wrong. And that's, so today, to, what I'm trying to say is today, uh, you can get a Bible that supports your version of your theology. You can, so and this is one of the reasons why I think we have so many um, modern translations. You can get uh, Bibles that support your theories, your ideas, your theology. And this is, a, this is crucial for Adventists. So let me tell you, let me, um, let me uh, show you where the other, uh, the other times that the word Hagia turns up. The first one is in chapter eight, verse two. And here, in the King James, it's translated as sanctuary, but it should be, the word is Hagia, so it should be um, holy place. And then the other ones are, we've already mentioned Hebrews 9, verse 2. That is definitely Hagia and definitely the holy place. And then it, uh, again in chapter 9, verse 8. With the King James translates it holiest of all, but the word is Hagia, and it should be holy place. And then we've already talked about chapter 9, verse 12. And then in chapter 10, verse 19, the, um, the King James translates this holiest when it should be holy place. And the last one is Hebrews 13, verse 11, where the King James translates it as sanctuary, but it should be holy place. So that's what I, that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, and I think it's vital for Seventh-day Adventists to understand this. It's like I say, because the whole, the whole thing, since um, Desmond Ford himself said, I no longer believe in the sanctuary message, probably millions of Adventists have followed him. I, I remember Desmond Ford, after he got 
after he got let go by the church, he established his own organization called Gospel Unlimited. And he went around the world preaching on the, on the Sabbath to Adventist people. I remember when he came to New Zealand, I, I belonged to a, a large church, about 300 people. And he would only come to the main, main city of Auckland and then he would go to Australia. Uh, and he would only preach w- once on Sabbath morning. And when he th- came, nothing was ever said in, my, in the church about him coming. But when he came, half the church disappeared. <laughs> and they all went to listen to him. <laughs> and so he went around preaching to Adventists and gathering a huge following and collecting tithes from everybody. and um, And so... His movement was uh, very, very large, but most of the Adventists who, who, who supported him, they stayed in the church. And I think he, he um, advised them to do that because his whole, his whole idea was we need to reform the Seventh-day Adventist church from within. And that's exactly what the liberals in the Adventist church today are trying to do. They are trying to change what they call reform the church into the image of um, the churches around us. It's exactly the same mistake that the Israelites made. You remember they wanted to be like the world. They wanted to have a king. They didn't want to be separate. They didn't want to be different. They didn't want to be holy and touch the unclean thing. And that's exactly the same impulse that is um, driving the liberal branch of our church to, to, um, to adapt to the pressures of the world by allowing the world to come in. And they now have a, the theology. They have the theology given to them by Desmond Ford to enable it to happen. So that's why, that's why we have these divisions in the church. And they're not going to go away. The wheat and the tears grow together until the last days. <laughs> So we just have to decide, my friends, which side we are going to be on. And and is the side that we choose supported by Scripture? Okay. So that's what I wanted to share with you. 